Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Frank Zappa and his pinko socks. <laughs> Frank, if you, if you were starting in music in 1986, what kind of music would you get involved in? I couldn't get a contract today. It Why? It would be impossible because of the way the record business works. I don't have the right hair for it. I don't wear enough zippers. And the topics <laughs> of the, and the songs that I write are just pretty much out of phase with what's going on in the music business. What kind of music are you writing now? Well, the stuff that I'm doing now is mostly with a computer. Computerized music? Yeah. And uh, don't you think there would be a market for that today? Not when he uses the voices of senators and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no. Let me tell you about that. Uh, I happen to think there is a market for that, but I'm checking out a nasty rumor that somebody is trying to keep that record out of stores in America. You mean you've actually already made the record? Oh, it's out, yeah. You wouldn't know it because it's awfully hard to find. It's called Frank Zappa Meets the Mothers of Prevention. But I think some people are, <laughs> some people are trying to prevent people, other people from finding out about the prevention. Well, what, what have you done in the, uh, the album? You said that you quote senators. Do you... Do you I use their voices. Well, I, do you, can you legally get permission to use their voices? It's all public record. And uh, what, is the, what is the thrust of the album? The thrust of the album is music, but there's a 12-minute piece on there, which is, uh, let's just call it gross conversation, which transpired at the Senate last September. Now, when, when, you, when you say gross conversation... Uh, because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't um, legislation, it wasn't really politics, it was PR, and it just turned into gross conversation. I mean, so, some of you might know that I went there and I attended this... Um, they called it um, an airing of the issue, uh, which they shouldn't have done. I don't think legally you can just uh, go into the Senate, uh, call the committee together, and take your issue and air it unless you're talking about some legislation. There was no legislation being discussed. I thought it was really inappropriate. I also felt that it was inappropriate that five of the senators sitting on this commission, or uh, you know, I, what do I call it, committee, it was the Senate Science, uh, Commerce, and Transportation Committee hearing the issue of rock and roll lyrics, which seems rather inappropriate, unless you know that five of the senators on that committee had wives who signed the original PMRC letter. So it was kind of a cross between a kangaroo court and uh, a, something taken completely out of context. I would, I would like, speaking of taking out of context, you see, I want to get back to the business of those quotes. Yeah. Now, I just have the feeling, sort of kind of knowing you, that maybe what you did is you took that some of the people who were looking to label records mm -hmm. probably were reading before the committee uh, lyrics that they thought might have been too sexual in nature, too scatological in nature. Well, that's one of the things that took place there. I mean, some of the things that are quoted in this piece are... Uh, Senator Hollings from uh, South Carolina saying that if he could do away with this music constitutionally, he would, which I don't think I took it out of context to just quote him exactly the way he said and, and it. And that's in, that's in the album? Yes. Now, did you happen to take, were there, were there some of the, the, the women who testified there, were they too sensitive to say, uh, read some of the lyrics? Or did they actually read some of those lyrics, and did you lift some of their quotes for the album? No, the, the person who was reciting the, the more obnoxious lyrics was Reverend Jeff Ling, and he's, it's his voice that's used reciting the, uh, the pieces. But prior to the hearing, um, both uh, Tipper Gore and uh, Susan Baker were on evening news all over the country reciting the lyrics themselves. Frank, how many children do you have? Four. And how old are they now? Uh, 18, 16, 12, and 6. Well, they grew up in a household that had the Frank Zapp as the father. And I'm sure that you were probably as liberal with your language around the children, or were you? As, as you I would be on this show if it weren't for forces of evil. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't look at me when you say that. <laughs> but uh, w they, 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 went to, they went to public schools? They went to both. They uh, went to public school and to private school. Um, where are they now in terms of education? Well, the two older ones took the California high school equivalency test at 15, which means you can escape from the California school system and no longer have to attend, and the two younger ones are still going.
Uh, the, the, the two that took the equivalency test, did they go on to college? No, they didn't have any desire to. And I, I concur because I think that in California, until you start putting the money back into the school system, pay the teachers what they're really worth, and uh, this should happen all over the country because they just haven't spent the money to, to encourage people to learn and to make it okay to be smart. It hasn't been okay to be smart in the United States for centuries. And unless somebody in the media says, you know what, if, if we made it look like it was okay to have brains and still be an American, and that was an ideal thing to do, then maybe kids would be interested in learning. But what, instead of, of that, what they've done is they've made the schools poor, they've made them weak, They've paid the teachers a substandard salary, which means that the good ones took off and wanted to do something else because, you know, who wants to put up with that kind of abuse and who well, loses? Yeah, but Frank, why, why is, doesn't music in the 1980s reflect that? I mean, when you got into music in the 60s, you had social protests going on, you had the starting of the Vietnam War. Now, you could look at television and not know that anything was happening, or you could mm -hmm. look at the national magazines and you could go to movies and it was like there was a vacuum in the world except for music. It was like the one great creative force in the 60s was music. And that's music. why they're trying to stifle it now. But it, it, the point is that you, there are creative folks out there, like yourself, who would probably want to write original music. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can suppress those creative forces. It doesn't... Yes, there is a way. There is a way. It's very easy. You just don't play it on the radio. Because if it doesn't go on the radio, then nobody knows it exists. When you go to a record store, you can't just say, hey, that's an interesting looking record. Let me listen to it. They usually won't let you play it. So you make your decision based on the album cover. But, or you hear something playing in the store. It's easy to suppress the but stuff. But Frank, the same thing happened in the 60s. They tried to suppress those uh, albums, and they still got on the air. And if they didn't get on the air, they still sold. And I'd like to come back and pursue that. We'll be right back with Frank Zappa. Wanted, reliable person to sleep at night with veterans. Room and board free. Welcome back. We're talking to Frank Zappa. Uh, Frank, why isn't there anybody writing music today? Or maybe there is. Uh, maybe you've run across somebody who's trying to write some music that reflects where society is going. But the music, the contemporary music, aside from the heavy metal and the acid rock and the rest of it, doesn't seem to be significant about anything other than perhaps personal or human relationships. Why? Uh, well, for one thing, that's uh, what the marketplace seems to be most interested in. I don't think people are interested in issue-oriented songs because the bulk of the people who consume pop music want to dance to it, not listen to the words. So. Uh, the words become trivialized and, you know, repetitious and become part of the rhythm of the dance song. And that's what the record companies uh, appear to be looking for when they sign a group. Can, wait, wait. Very little music that, get, that gets signed is non-dance music. When you started the Mothers of Invention, what did your parents think? Well, uh, let's just say they weren't all that thrilled about it. Uh. <laughs> How do they feel now that you wear a tie? Well, uh, <laughs> my father's dead, and uh, my mother, I think she thinks it's okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess I get back to the, one of the first questions I asked. If you were starting in music today, now you're doing computer music. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like, obviously, you have something to say sitting here talking about the forces of evil. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you translate that into music? Why would you go further away from music and maybe even humanity by getting into computerized music? Well, for one thing, the machine that I'm using makes it possible to have uh, completely accurate performances of the ideas that I come up with. And I got into music not as rock and roll. I first started off writing chamber music and orchestra music when I was 14. I didn't write a rock and roll song until I was 21. And the only reason I did that is because all the music that I wrote uh, when I was a teenager and tried to get orchestras to perform it, I couldn't hear it. Nobody would play it. So you, if you write music, you want to have some of it heard. And so I went into rock and roll. Uh, but I have no uh, problem with writing instrumental music and using a computer and getting my point across by coming on a show like this and just saying it right out. But, but in, in, in the transition from doing chamber music to rock and roll, because you seem to be one of the great forerunners of, I guess, what would you call it today, heavy metal? I tend to doubt that I was a forerunner of heavy metal. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> but if you say so. <laughs> uh, how, would you, how would you describe the music? The kind of music then? that I play? I play variety music. Yeah. <laughs> It's, oh, I, I have country and western songs. I have songs that sound, uh, you know, like, uh, 
sort of heavy metal. I have other songs that sound like Broadway show tunes. I, I can write all different styles of music. One of the, one of the ladies, uh, I can't recall, the, one of the ladies who's involved with uh, the group who was testifying to have the uh, lyrics labeled said that she felt that the, this event at the Senate in September, those hearings were a break for your diminishing career. Well, I'm sure that that's quite true, and, uh, and probably much to their consternation, because uh, I think that I have the kind of career that they would like to see diminish even further. Because, the, <laughs> the, the, because the, usually the more frequently I get the opportunity to go on television and say some stuff, the more POQ is involved. That's the question. <laughs> and, uh, you know, go ahead and bleep it, I don't care. But, uh, 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 Frank, uh, 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 America wants to hear it. Do you see that? Uh, <laughs> Frank, I must tell you, the forces of evil uh, <laughs> do not want to hear the word quotient on uh, television. Uh, no. uh, <laughs> in, 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 in growing up with the music of the 60s, did you come in, in contact with a lot of those, the Bob Dylans? The, were you a fan of his or was he a fan of yours? And in some of those people, have you seen much change in their attitude, both about life and their music? Well, you want a Bob Dylan story? I got one for you. Will you, <laughs> will, 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 will you use the word quotient? Yes. <laughs> No, uh, I liked uh, a couple of the early Bob Dylan albums. I, I didn't care for it too much when it was like purely folk music. Then he went electric, and he had a couple of albums there, and I really liked those. Could, uh, could you save that story until we, sure. we, we take this break? We'll be right back with Quotient. Uh, <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Foreign policy competition. Yeah, Which yeah. one writes the worst foreign policy? Exactly. <laughs> welcome, welcome back. We're talking to Frank Zappa. Frank, tell us the Bob Dylan story. Well, uh, one day uh, my office got a call from somebody who said they were Bob Dylan. And uh, we do get some strange phone calls. And nobody believed that it really was Bob Dylan, but it was. And uh, to make a long story very short, he eventually wound up at my house. It was a freezing cold night and we have a, a video monitor so we can see who's at the gate. And there was a guy standing at the gate, you know, I didn't recognize who he was and he was just wearing a sports shirt and I knew it was cold outside. And I, you know, who is this? So I sent the engineer down to the gate to find out who it was and it was Bob Dylan. So he comes in and uh, I'd never met him before. How you doing Bob? And uh, he wanted me to produce an album for him. So we played some songs and you know, talked a little while. I said, well, come on up to the kitchen. I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and comes up in the kitchen, and my dog growls at him. And uh, I said, relax, Bob, my dog doesn't like Christians. And, uh, <clears throat> but then I realized this was at the point where he had stopped being born again and was back to being Jewish. So I knew that, that he was very safe. Uh, <laughs> why? And don't hold it against my dog, because he has a right to make up her own mind. <laughs> You, you, you're going to, you, strangely enough, in spite of all this that's going on, you're going to be speaking at a, a religious Nebra seminar. Yeah, well, it's at the Nebraska Wesleyan University School of Religion on uh, April 7th. I'm going there to uh, speak to them. Yeah. And when, when did this come about? I talked to the guy on the phone today. Just happened today? Yeah. And w will you use words like quotient? Yes. <laughs> So I explained to him on the phone, uh, well, first of all, I needed to find something about the college. It's, it's a Methodist-affiliated college. They have some fundamentalist instructors there. And I asked them, you know, basically why they wanted me to go there. And they said that uh, their school was interested in education rather than indoctrination, and that they like to bring in unusual points of view or differing points of view just to expose the student body to it. It's a liberal arts college. And I said, I'm in favor of education, and you want me to talk to you? I'll be there, and I'm going to talk. How terrific. Good for them. And good for you. And we'll be right back after this. Thanks. Well, well, welcome back. Frank, uh, you did an episode of uh, Miami Vice and uh, a lot of the, the crew members around here. First of all, they thought you did a terrific job as an actor. But secondly, some of them said, They're easily amused. No. Uh, <laughs> secondly, they were surprised that somebody whose music was anti-drugs 
And in person, I am anti-drugs, yes. Yeah, and, and yet in, in, in that episode, you portrayed a kind of a pusher. Well, you see, if you go on Miami Vice, there's not much choice of the roles. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's about it, you know? And uh, they didn't have a hairdresser or anything like that on the show at the time, so... But I think that anybody who would look at the character that I played on that show and thereby be induced to use drugs is in need of medical attention. <laughs> yes. We, we, we're gonna because that was an ugly guy <laughs> we're gonna have to go now but dur during the break frank said something really interesting about uh, the philippines and i and i don't want to paraphrase him or i don't want to qu uh, quote him al could you take a shot of frank on camera two kind of a close shot on camera two we got, this is this camera two this? is this camera two Oh, oh, you're on three. Look into uh, Frank. No, Frank. Look into look into camera three and and tell the audience at home exactly what you told me and the audience here during the break. About. I think you know, you know Imel, Imelda's three thousand pairs of underpants we've been hearing about. They should auction those things off like they're doing with the Rajneesh's Rolls Royces. <laughs> You know, just a little extra something for the Filipino people because you know all the rest of that Marcos money that's stashed away, they're trying to find. It doesn't belong to the Filipino people. It belongs to U.S. taxpayers because it came from here before he embezzled it. That's great. Frank, thank you very, very much for being here.